after about three months of no one using those doors, I'm like, was that the worst misstep we've ever taken in building projects? Because that was a big project. <laughs> I think that what throws you off is that you feel like you're just walking into a wall, but you're not. It's an, it's an optical illusion. Hey, guys. How's it going? So good to see you. I just got back from, uh, from roughing it in Western Australia with my son, Henry, for two weeks. And I had a childhood dream uh, satisfied and that I was able to rub a giant wombat's stomach. And uh, have, you, <laughs> have you seen a wombat? They're like the most amazing creature. Uh, yeah, what a, what a cool, I was obsessed with Australia when I was a little kid. Like my favorite movie was this weird little kind of pseudo animated film called Dot the Red Kangaroo. And uh, I loved Crocodile Dundee. Like, I lo really loved that. And I, and I loved The Man from Snowy River. Like, I went and saw that on my birthday in third grade. I love that movie so much. <laughs> uh, it was a great trip. It was a great trip. Hey, before we get into the word, um, just one uh, final uh, announcement that um, I just told Russ I'd like to do is that this Thursday night um, at Imago Day. The group of pastors in the city, myself included, got together and just discussed, you know, how we've been doing since Dorf Up started uh, partnering uh, in the citywide prayer and fasting called Seven. Uh, and we decided that it just we needed to kind of have a fresh approach to it, uh, that it was uh, challenging to get all the churches in the area to participate in a seven-day thing in the fall because so many churches are beginning new, you know, new classes, new new teaching series, and it just it just messed with everyone's like normal rhythms um, and so the churches that were really invested in it really benefited from it and then churches that were kind of lighthearted about it didn't get as much out of it and so what we decided is that it's essential that the church prays it's essential that we pray together as a church in a city that needs the gospel and so what we're going to be doing for the churches that are in the urban core is um, quarterly is a thing called one uh, and uh, I know in April um, uh, door of hope and New Song will be hosting it together. Um, Imago is hosting it this Thursday. Uh, I'll be leading a season of prayer, but it's basically all the churches in the Portland area are coming together to just pray for, an, pray for an hour and a half and worship together. And so I'd encourage you guys to come at uh, 7 p.m. I'd love to see a strong showing from Door of Hope. Uh, and I think it's, I mean, with all that we have going on, I uh, would love to see you guys participating uh, in that because we need lots of prayer right now. Uh, you know, just to state uh, in regards to Australia, you know, going there, I was like, uh, uh, there was part of me, I'm like, why am I, why did I say yes to such a long trip? And I'm like, oh yeah, because it was a free trip to Australia. But there was, there, uh, <laughs> uh, there was, there was actually, I, I saw that the Lord really had a, a great reason in it. And one of the things that was really awesome about the church is it, f it reaffirmed uh, our commitment to move toward this parish model. Uh, and because there's, I'm not going to lie, when you make such a dramatic change and you take on a second building and you're needing to raise up more leaders and more volunteers and, you know, people don't like change and they get nervous and, you know, as they say, the sheep get a little skittish when you make big changes. Uh, I'm like, Lord, this, I feel that this is what you call us to from the beginning. Going to Australia and ministering at a, a really sweet uh, a really sweet community. Um, Perth is weird. It, it's, uh, they call Perth what we would call downtown Portland. So any neighborhoods like Northwest or, you know, Hillsdale or Monoma Village or Alberta or Hawthorne, they would call those towns. They don't even know they're all part of the city of Perth. So like the cool part of Perth, it's essentially like, uh, like Portland, I think, is an area called Fremantle, and it's actually its own city. Uh, about 10 minutes southwest, like right on the water. Uh, and it's the lovely town that gave us this year's best record, Tam and Paula. Uh, but it, it's a great, great artistic community. And just, just being there, just seeing the desperate need for the gospel. And the church that I was ministering at is a, in uh, this Calvary Chapel in a place called Secret Harbor, which is essentially a surf, little surf community, about 20 minutes south of the heart of the city. And th only about 200 people in the church. And the thing that I saw was that because of the intimacy of the church, uh, it wasn't so small that it was awkward, and it wasn't so big that people couldn't be known. And, so, and because Perth is a truly post-Christian uh, part of the world where there just aren't many Christians, there is just a real camaraderie amongst the community um, and a partnership with the pastoral team, which is totally bivocational there. 
Uh, Keith Carmody, the lead pastor, is a full-time chaplain. Uh, he's a chaplain for the, uh, for the police force there and also for the Fremantle, uh, the, their version of the NFL. Has anyone ever watched um, Aussie Rules football? I mean, I don't understand American football, but I was, <laughs> Aussie Rules was like, if you've read Harry Potter, it was like Quidditch. I, seriously, the only thing that was lacking was brooms and the snitch. <laughs> it was the weirdest sport ever. I'm like, what is this? It's a round field, and the game is completely built on everything we would call a foul or a fumble. Because they're like, do you fumble? No, that's still in play. And they just tackle each other in weird uniforms. And, and I kept making jokes, and all of a sudden I realized the Australians take their they're what they call footy, even that's funny, uh, um, <laughs> very seriously. And they're like, it's the only, it's called, it's called real football. I'm like, no, <laughs> nope, mm -mm, that is not real football. I, is, I don't know what this is. Uh, <laughs> but it was pretty amazing. But we had, my son went with me, Henry, and we just loved it. But I just would just encourage you guys, as change is challenging. Some of you are like, why are we doing another parish? And it just seems crazy and it's not to spread us thin, it's actually to create deeper intimacy and greater commitment to the various neighborhoods of the, of the city, but really to create a greater commitment to you, uh, that you can be known and know one another. Because I think in order for us to truly be an apostolic church, um, that, that there needs to be an, a, 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 a true sense of community when people come in. And the bigger a church gets, the less it feels like a community and the more it feels like a show. Um, and believe me, my natural tendency would be to get a big space and just do giant services because that's the evangelist in me, but that's, that's, not, that's not what it takes to run a church. It's not what it takes to care for people. Um, and so, so we're committed to this because we believe it's the right thing to do. It also forces us to raise up more leaders. It forces, it, it forces the hand to not be built around cult of personality. Um, and, it, and, it, and it also forces the hand on body participation. That is that each of you should take partnership um, in kingdom purposes in the various communities where you live. So I'm excited about it, and I hope you guys are as well. Um, and it's going to take some time to, to uh, flesh out all the, the nuances. I actually am going to New York next week to meet with, uh, with uh, Tim Keller's team and talk to them about how they're doing three locations. And uh, and John Tyson at Trinity Grace, who has eight parishes. Um, so pray for me on that, just to seek wisdom on how to do this and do it well so we don't kill the church, but actually help it thrive. <laughs> so uh, with that said, why don't you turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew 19. Matthew 19. We're looking at a familiar, um, familiar passage, uh, what is commonly called the young rich ruler, funny, it's one of my favorite passages uh, to preach on because I think there's so much that can be said uh, about the culture in which we live um, from this, this text. Beginning in verse 16, let's read through these verses together. Matthew 19, verse 16. Just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good, Jesus replied. There is only one who is good, and if you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones, he inquired. And Jesus replied, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, Honor your father and mother. And then it's interesting that he ends, ends here because this one is, is I think, the, the hinge. It's the pin that if you pulled out, everything else collapses. And love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. And I believe he was sincere in that statement. What do I still lack? And Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. And when the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. And when, then Jesus said to his disciples, truly I tell you it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again I tell you it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. 
When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, Who then can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And Peter answered him, We have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? And Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or fields, for my sake, very key to understanding the thrust and the center of this entire passage will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life but many who are first will be last and many who are last will be first let's pray lord jesus we come before you right now a people who are bombarded each and every day with the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And Lord, our request and our desire this day is that we would see that in you lies the key, the answer to rest for the restless human soul. That in you We find the focus that tears away the distractions that lead to despair. In you, Jesus, we find that eternal life is not something, but that it is someone. In you, we find that there is a future and a hope. We find that in you, there is no one who is breathing that is beyond the hope of salvation. For what is impossible with man is possible with you. I pray, Jesus, that we would take your word in deeply today. May it convict where conviction is necessary, but I pray that it would comfort, for it is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. Jesus, we don't have to go away sad. For you are waiting to be wanted. And Lord, the question is, how will we respond? And so be with us now, we pray in your name. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. Well, I want to begin with, uh, with two quotes. So I've titled this message, The Divine Disconnect, because I believe that we are living in an age in the West that there is a true disconnect from the things that actually matter that brings satisfaction to the human soul. And nowhere is that disconnect more prevalent than in Western culture. Australia is a truly post-Christian society. America, Portland is that as well, and the rest of the country is not far behind. And there is a tremendous disconnect uh, in the day in which we live. And that disconnect, I think, is, is summed up in these two quotes uh, before us. The first comes from St. Gregory the Great. Uh, I've been reading through the Patristic Fathers, and St. Gregory the Great uh, was a fourth century uh, monk, and uh, he was uh, actually a really incredible man uh, who wrote a, a very profound book called uh, The Rule of Pastoral Care. Now, he has an ascetic tradition that is very foreign to our context of Christianity. That is that there was a tremendous amount of devotion to what we call the spiritual disciplines, to prayer, to fasting, to solitude, uh, to the denial of the flesh, all of those things that we often kind of smirk at as some kind of weird legalism. But Gregory was most definitely motivated. His disciplines were motivated by a devotion to the living Christ. And he wrote, in my opinion, so far, a quarter of the way through it, uh, one of the most profound books and practical books on, on what it takes to be a shepherd uh, that I've ever read. And honestly, there are points in it where I'm reading and I'm like, I should not be a pastor. Uh, and then I have to remind myself that he does have an aesthetic slant that at times is extreme, where 
you read it and you're like, am I even saved? Uh, <laughs> but this is, this is a profound moment where he talks about the dangers as a, as a spiritual leader, as a shepherd, of having the right answers but not the right practice, of being distracted by the things of the world. He says, clearly the mind cannot focus well on one matter when it is divided by many things. And I hate that sentence so much. Uh, it is like a man so preoccupied on a journey, he forgot where he was going. So the first thing that I want you to see that we are dealing with in our society, and it will help us understand how, prev how just relevant the story of the young rich ruler is, uh, is that we are a society that is driven by what? Distraction. Distraction. There are a million things that are vying for our attention and our affections. And, there, <laughs> and honestly, this, the things that the society offers to the senses is quite alluring. And the ways that technology has infiltrated every aspect of our lives that we, have, we now have at our disposal the ability through social media and other means to keep ourselves at the center of our universes, we are a distracted people. And because we're so distracted, the second quote uh, is the outcome of that distraction. It comes from our own great thinker and writer, Henry David Thoreau, who once wrote this statement so long ago, and yet it's almost prophetic for the day in which we live. The mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. You've probably heard that before. Do you believe that? I think that that is extremely accurate. That the longer we live, the more that we have, the more the pursuit of happiness seems like an, a total and absolute impossibility. We have more health, longer lifespans, more material possessions than we know what to do with because on a world standard, and I just want you guys to see this, as we read through the text, the natural tendency is to read the young rich ruler as something that I am not. Well, he's rich, and man, this, I'm glad I'm not rich. No, based upon the standards of the, I mean, have you been to Bangalore or... Have you, been, have you been to India, to Africa, to Mexico, to anywhere in Central America or even South America? Have you been to most of the livable planet? You will find that the standard by which we live, that even our poor are rich. And so we see these two realities, what I call the distraction that ultimately leads to despair. Because though we live longer and though we have more, at our disposal and more information available to us than ever before in human history, depression is on an, on an in continual rise. You know, Australia has the highest suicide rate in the world. I partially think it's because you can't go in the water without getting eaten by a great white shark there. <laughs> Seven people bit in half last year in Perth. Would you surf? Those are not good odds. I don't care. <laughs> like, that's like, you're like I, could, you're like, I could either drive today or surf. Either one is equally dangerous there. Uh, it is a weird place that it is like Eden, one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen, and yet its fields are filled with the most poisonous snake in the world, and its waters are infested with man-eating sharks. So I don't know. <laughs> uh, but in Australia has, in all seriousness, it has the highest suicide rate in the world. And I was asking Keith, I'm like, how could this place that's like paradise? I mean, it really is like paradise. And minimum wage in Australia is $25 an hour. A school teacher first year in Australia makes 100000 a year. It's part of the reason why the pastors at this church are bivocational. <laughs> You're like, I am in the wrong country. Uh, you are. And yet they, they have all of that. Uh, they have all of that. And yet they have the highest suicide rate. Perfect climate, beautiful, well-paid jobs, low poverty, almost zero homelessness. And yet, <laughs> we went into Perth and he goes, Keith's like, you're going to see some pretty sketchy stuff. 
went in downtown. I, I'm not joking. Like, we walked through the entire downtown. I saw, like, one homeless person. I'm like, what, what are you talking about? He goes, he goes, there's a lot of weirdos down here. I'm like, you have, A, I'm the weirdest person in this city, <laughs> and you have not come to Portland, Oregon. <laughs> and yet, this place of perpetual sunshine, casual temperaments, easygoing lifestyle, and yet total despair. And he said, you know why? It's because they have nothing to live toward because God is not real in our country. And he goes, we need people to come to Australia and bring the gospel. And then I was like, all right, you talked me into it. (laughs) (laughs) I'll get my teaching degree first. Uh, (laughs) This disconnect is real. And I think that it's because we've put a premium on what can be achieved with the senses rather than understanding that that ultimately will not satisfy. If you go to the next slide, please, there's a, there, this is the thing. If we look at the title of, the, of, of this man that approaches Jesus, we're, if we draw from all three gospel accounts, we are, that's where we get the title, Young Rich Ruler, that these are the three obsessions that have captivated the imagination of the West and have left us distracted and despairing. The first is youth. Matthew 19, we're told that he was a young man, the second is prosperity. Uh, actually, all of the accounts speak of his wealth, but in Mark, it says that he had great wealth. Um, Luke gives us an interesting insight in Luke 18, and uh, in, in, in that is that he has recognition or fame. He it calls him a certain ruler, which means he was a, he was a man of, of, of prominence in his society. All three of these things, youth, wealth, and fame, are the three things that drive our culture and our society, and I would argue drive the West. This is what we have been told will bring value to our lives. Is there any idolatry around old age in the West? We've seen infomercials for Girls Gone Wild. Ever seen Grandma's Gone Wild? Nope. I've been using that joke for like seven years, and I never get tired of it. I never get tired of it. (laughs) There is a worship of youth in our culture, a deep desire to, to ignore our own mortality and see the value. We don't value wisdom with experience. We value beauty. We value it to the point that the cosmetic industry alone is like $3.5 billion dollars or more. Darcy and I were in Aspen, Colorado, which is like Hollywood at 15,000 feet, and we were eating at this restaurant, and there was a woman sitting across from me whose plastic surgery had been so extensive, it was impossible to tell her age, so that worked for her, Um, but it was also impossible to tell if she was a human being, because she looked like a cat without hair. Her her eyes were like, like that thing, where like her face was, have you ever seen that movie Brazil? You know that The stretching of that face. It was like that. And at first I snickered and was grateful for the entertainment during lunch. And then I felt bad (laughs) because I realized behind the horrifying exterior of a woman who was doing all that she could to keep some sort of semblance of the only thing that she felt would give her value, which was her youthful beauty, which was now gone and destroyed, she would have been better off allowing nature to take its course. She actually probably would have been more beautiful as an elderly woman than a woman who tried to ignore and utilize her wealth to achieve something that is not achievable because it doesn't matter how much plastic surgery you get, the death rate is one per person. The scripture honors the silver hair. We ignore our elderly. We often hide them away in in homes where even as families, and we're one of the few cultures that do not take honor your mother and father to the point that most other cultures would say you take care of your parents until they die. No, we put them in homes where we don't have to deal with them, where we can actually avoid again, with the great delusion that we really will live forever. We really will live forever, and we won't. Youth is something that our culture worships. And with youth comes 
vitality, but it also comes with incredible immaturity. And we live in a city that is n notorious for its absolute unwillingness to grow up. The whole reason we live here with that sort of, and I think that it's, I don't even think it's Portland anymore. I think it's a millennial uh, thing that is driven by this kind of stunted growth, uh, especially among males, sadly. And so this is a problem. And this young man has first mark against him. Second is that he had great wealth. And youth with wealth is a really terrifying thing. Uh, and here he is a prosperous person. And see, the, the worship of material belongings. Because here's the thing, is that you cannot have hardly anything. And I believe, I've married plenty of people in our church that I don't know how they survive. You know, you have two baristas married and you're living on a combined income that an Australian would find quite humorous or terrifying. It, it, but here's the thing is that the, the worship of, of the material in our society means that it's idolatry for those that have. It's all about protecting what you have. And for those that don't have, it's all about longing for what others have. Neither, neither place is a very healthy place. So you're not better off because you have nothing if you're still obsessed with everything that everyone else has. And so wealth marks both the poor and the rich. Why do you think that, that uh, the classic depiction of poor, uneducated America is, are those that sit around and watch talk shows all day and are obsessed with the cheap magazines that tell us what the celebrities have done bad this week? Or, you know, how one celebrity was once beautiful and now look at this candid shot they got of her after her second baby or whatever. It's like, you know, those people buy that. Why do they buy those magazines? Because they are longing for that which they don't have. It's because we, it doesn't matter what class you're in in society, we're still driven by the same weird obsessions that create distraction and, and, and despair. And then finally, that certain, that he was a certain ruler. I mean, this third reality of being of being young, being wealthy, and being a ruler, these are the three gods. This is the trinity of Western culture. This is the Father, Son, Holy Spirit of carnality right here. And this recognition, the desire to be known, is there anything wrong with being young? No. I would argue that no revivals ever happened apart from it beginning with young adults actually in, in history, that I've been able to find. It's almost always begun with young adults. Is there anything wrong with desiring the needs necessary for existence? Absolutely not. God gave Adam and Eve the world. He says, be fruitful, multiply, subdue the earth. God is generous, incredibly generous. Is there anything wrong with the desire to be known? No, it's a fundamental desire of every human heart to be loved. But you see, all of these desires, the reason that they become so unhealthy is because they are obsessions. They're things that become the source of our idolatry. It's the things that we think we can't live without and that if we had them, we wouldn't need anything else. And I would argue, including Jesus. So if we can go to the next slide. So here we begin with the fundamental misstep of this young, rich ruler. It says, just then the man came up, up to Jesus and he asked him, teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? And before I point out the misstep, I want to point out something that I think is a worthy quality of this young man that we often ignore because we want to just throw him under the bus. He's not... You know, I'm not like him. You know, clearly he held a, a place in society that I would never even know. But listen, we, like I just said, youth, wealth, fame, recognition, it's the desire of the Western heart. But the thing that this man has that I think is often missing in the church, because I think that we think of these things as things that happen outside. This story is about a guy that's not saved. 
It has nothing to do with me as a follower of Jesus. No, it has everything to do with you as a follower of Jesus because the problem that the young rich ruler had is the same problem that we continue to have as believers and it plagues the church and it's what creates a shallowness and a lack of authenticity that does not convince the world out there that what we have is something that they actually need. And here we have the thing that, that before us that should convict you is that the man did something. If you were to read the other accounts, we're told in Mark that he ran to Jesus and that he knelt before him. There is a sense of urgency and reverence in this man's pursuit that is often lacking amongst Christians. So as we look at the missteps, I'm going to point out the things that we're missing that he did do. Because what has marked our culture is that we've become so distracted by all that the world has to offer that it has created a paralysis. Have you ever heard of that book on ADHD called Driven to Distraction? And one of the things, if you know anything about true, like tr everyone claims to be ADHD on some level, and the question is, is, is it... Is it, is it real or is it just a societal outcome of too much stimulation? But, but the, the ADHD mind is a mind that races so fast and is scattered in so many directions that that distraction actually leads to the inability to move any direction, the inability to accomplish anything. It's the person that starts a million tasks and can't get, can't get anything finished. They say that da Vinci actually was a man that whose interests were so broad, like what St. Gregory said, that most of his work is incomplete work. Total genius, but had he focused on a few things, he probably would have built a plane. <laughs> uh, and so you, you have this, this reality that we live in an age where the distractions are so intense that we are paralyzed in our spiritual pursuit and growth. And so when I ask Christians who are like struggling in the faith, and, and if I was to ask you if, to raise your hand, for those of you that can go days on end without even opening your Bible, I think that you wouldn't be willing to do that. And I think that we would all be horrified by the, how natural it is for a church to be full on Sunday, but to have many within its midst, if not a large contingency, that take spiritual disciplines uh, very lightly. Very little pursuit because like the young rich ruler, your church life, your Christian life is just one more compartment in your already very full life. And so when it comes to the first piece of the Christian life is that when Jesus meets us in our brokenness, he says, he doesn't leave us in our brokenness, he says, rise up and follow me. And you see the fundamental misstep of this young man is that he did the right thing. He went to Jesus and he, and, and he ran to him and he pursued him and there's urgency. And man, that falls in line with the text. Today is the day of salvation. A need to say, I will arise and go to my father. That Jesus saves us, but then we have to work out that salvation with fear and trembling. That we've got to actually pursue him. That we actually have to seek him. That we actually have to follow him. And he doesn't even tell us where he's going. And see, that's where we now have to look at this man's misstep because it begins with what he calls Jesus. What does he call him? Teacher. What's wrong with that? The fundamental problem with this man's address of Jesus is that Jesus cannot be your teacher until he is first your what? Lord. You see, the problem with this man's question is there is absolutely no surrender in it. It's about doing and having. What good thing must I do to have eternal life? Tim Keller often says this great phrase I love. He says, he says religion at its core says live like this, do, and God will accept you. But the Christianity at its core says God has accepted you in Jesus Christ. Now live like this. You see, the devotion that is necessary to drive discipline is lacking here. This man sees Jesus as a means to acquiring for himself 
another thing. And this is the fundamental problem, is he thinks he can do something to earn something. But what did Jesus say about eternal life in John 17? He said, this is eternal life. Gives us a definition of it. And what is that definition? This is eternal life, that they may believe in you, the living God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That they may know you, not believe, excuse me, that they may know you, the living God. Eternal life is intimate knowledge of the living God. He thought eternal life was something. Eternal life was standing in front of him. But eternal life cannot be obtained through knowledge. It is obtained through surrender. Jesus surrendered everything so that you and I could be set free, not to do what we want or to live as we want or to continue to control our own destiny but to do what is right as we recognize his lordship. It is only then that you become his partner. But you see, we want to be partners with Jesus without his rule over our lives. But sin, in its very essence, is a rejection, or excuse me, a rebellion against God's sovereign rule and a rejection of his love. The two fundamental problems with our existence is that we're constantly trying to control our own lives and we don't believe fundamentally that God really loves us. And so we turn to the things that the world has to offer, to youth, to material possessions, to recognition, and think that, that will be the thing that satisfies, and it never does. It never satisfies. How many people do we have to see, make it all the way to the top to discover there's nowhere to go and they jump off the other side? How many stars do we need to see take their own lives because they're so incredibly unhappy? Because they have everything that the world has to offer and they found that that absolutely doesn't satisfy. How many times will that have to happen before we actually believe that there's nothing up there for us? And if there's nothing there, then where do we turn? And that should bring us to that fundamental place of anxiety. I must find a way out of this trap, this rat race. Jesus is the answer to the young man, but the young man doesn't see Jesus as the answer. He sees Jesus as a means to the answer. And Jesus will not be our means. He will be our Lord or he will be nothing. Doing and having. <laughs> Notice how it just plays into his already natural tendency toward a spirit of acquisition. And we're not called to try and acquire more. We're, tr we're called to surrender all. And what this young man doesn't realize is that, is that the key to the Christian life is actually giving Jesus the ability to be responsible for us. You see, when Jesus was asked, in John chapter 6, what must I do to do the work of God? What must I do? He said, this is the work of God that you believe. It's not a belief that is stagnant or apathetic, which is, I think, the one th thing that this young man is not. He's not apathetic. He's seeking the right person, but unfortunately, he's asking the wrong question. Our problem is that we may have asked the right question, but we're not seeking the answer because we get lazy because we're paralyzed by all that the world speaks into our lives. We can go to the next slide, please. Here is the universal problem, and that humanity is a mixture, because Jesus says, why do you ask me about what is good? In Mark, he says, why do you call me good? There is one who is good, and that is God. And I think what he, Jesus is essentially is saying, why, why do you... Why do you think that you understand what goodness is? There is no one who is good but God. And what he was doing in that moment was he was not denying that he was good. But what he was denying is that the man was fundamentally good. Now, here's the thing. I want to be very careful. When we speak of a doctrine that has been held to by the church uh, since its beginning, which we call total depravity, it's often... It's often viewed with a wrong idea that there is actually nothing good um, in the human soul. Nothing good about us. Everything is 
garbage. No, that's not true because God made man and he called it good. But what we need to understand is that all the good that is in us and that we are capable of has unfortunately been infiltrated by that which is bad, sin. A constant tendency to rebel against God's rule, to reject his love. And, and here is the issue, is that this young man is asking, second thing that we should note about him is because he goes to Jesus and actually reverently seeks him out with a sense of urgency, he then is able to ask Jesus a question. And once again, for us, it's like, let's, let's, before we get, throw this man under the bus, let us ask the question, do we even take the time? If we don't take the time to go to Jesus, then we're probably not getting our questions answered as well. Because you actually have to go to him to ask him questions. And the problem, I, I hate that when people say like, Josh, thank you for that sermon. You're really answering a lot of questions that none of us are asking. Don't say that. That just sounds dumb. Unless I'm really answering really dumb questions, which is possible as well. But still, uh, I think that the, the question that, that is being asked by the young man uh, is a good one, and it, immediately Jesus is willing to enter into a dialogue with him because Christianity is about relationship. Jesus is not going to chastise you for having a wrong idea about him, but we will stand before him one day and give an account why we ignored him altogether. But Jesus begins to unravel this man's view of himself. And this man has an unfortunate view of goodness. Because what he believes is, is that he has done what is right. He has done what is right. If we can go to the next slide. Here's, here's the mixture. He says, this is the great delusion. It's what we've been told from the times we were little kids. This man's an example of that. Believe in what? Yourself. Wait, I just saw this dumbest book at Powell's like yesterday. It was like, you're awesome. Ten ways to really know your awesomeness. Something stupid like that. I mean, it, that's actually a better title than it was. Uh, but it was like, it was just like, it was like a, a non-Christian Joel Osteen, your best self now book. It was like, it was even, it was so weird. I mean, the title alone, I'm just like, man, really? Like, I really want to know if this woman has figured out the key to recognizing our own awesomeness. Uh, the great delusion that we've been told again and again is to believe in ourselves, to trust in our own goodness, to believe the lie of that really unfortunate pop song by Sarah McLaughlin, we're all born innocent. I know that song, unfortunately, because my wife subjected me to that CD a lot when it came out. Um, but I, you know, she's not innocent for writing that. And we're not innocent because it's bad. It's bad for y'all. You're like, I don't get, I like that song. Uh, this is, this is the, the, the ideal that is put forth, is that human beings are innately good, and there is an absolute rejection of the idea of sin. We need to absolutely cling to the doctrine of sin. We need a healthy understanding of the doctrine of sin. David Brooks' book, The Road to Character, and I'm not even sure if David Brooks is a Christian, said that one of the things that would help American society move out of its moral ambiguity is to reclaim the idea of human brokenness. We're so confident in ourselves that we're incapable of seeing how dysfunctional we really are. And that's what this young man said, because Jesus lays out the commandments, and he says, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, but really he's just trying to get the young man to the end. He's like, he lays out the Ten Commandments, but then he throws in one at the end that is part of that golden rule, love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man once again gives us an insight into something that is good, but unfortunately the answer is wrong. What is good here is that he says, all these things I have kept, and I don't believe that he was lying. I think that he has something that most Christians lack, discipline. I think this man was extremely disciplined. I think he was absolutely sincere in his keeping of the law. But the problem is that the law was given not for the purpose of knowing what is right and what is wrong. The law was given for the purpose of putting a hedge around God's people so that they could know him intimately. And they missed that. 
And he misunderstood himself because if he knew, if he knew the scriptures of which he had said he had kept, he would know that the scripture is clear that the human heart is wicked and deceitful above all things and not to be trusted. Way too much confidence in his own ability to do good. And the illustration that I always like to use, that you've heard before, but I'll give it again because it's helpful, is it, if I miss the bus by five minutes and, and you come to the bus 30 minutes later, I'm not going to look at you and go, sucker. Like, I only missed it by five. You're both standing there waiting for the bus. Like, our natural tendency is to say, I'm not like the junkie in the alley or the prostitute that I drive by on 82nd. I'm not like that person. Oh, really? Well, compared to Jesus, you're much closer to that person than you think. And all that shows is our natural tendency towards selective sanctification. They do these externals bad. I don't do those things. Therefore, I must be good. They must define what is bad. Sin is not a measurement of how bad you are. It is a measurement of how good you are not. And if we don't understand that, this text will not help us. This is what the young man did not understand. In his mind, his view of righteousness was something that could be obtained through self-effort. And that is a fundamental problem. And it is driven by a misunderstanding that the gift that he needed was not something but someone. If I can go to the next text, please. Here's the crushing reality. Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. And when the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Now, this text has often been used by, by some, like Tolstoy, uh, to declare um, what I call a poverty gospel, that Jesus is promoting uh, self-imposed poverty. And that is definitely the leanings of the patristic fathers who, the, especially the desert fathers, many of the, of the monks. You know, the whole rise, it's fascinating, in church history, the whole rise of monasteries came out of Constantine taking Christianity as a, making it a national religion in Rome, is that what happened is that those Christians that had lived under the oppression and tyranny of a, of a Roman empire that would put to death Christians, they had to know what they believed, and they had to be willing to go all the way with it, lay down their lives for it, watch their own families be killed for it. The moment it became an empire religion, it opened up the possibility of churches filled with shallow pseudo-Christians. And so the desire for that original group of truly devoted, disciplined uh, individuals began to birth, uh, created an immediate rise in monasteries and monks that I don't want to be caught up in these divided, compromised Christians. I'm going to isolate myself. That wasn't, shouldn't have been the answer, but that's what they did. And so that ascetic, that ascetic life was that we began to promote, um, and that's where you start to see the thread of that kind of poverty gospel, that if you're going to truly follow Jesus, you should essentially possess nothing. I don't believe that is the essence of what, I don't think this is a prescriptive t teaching on that you and I are not truly following Jesus until we literally own nothing. But I do believe, and I don't want to overly spiritualize it, that that is what he asked this man to do. So let's not spiritualize this. Jesus went right for the throat with this guy. Because I pointed out three obsessions of culture. How do you bring down the whole house of cards? You pull out the middle pin. Young, rich. And all of a sudden, your recognition in society means nothing. And your youthfulness, that tendency toward immaturity and self-centeredness is eradicated because he doesn't just tell him to go sell everything he has. He says to give it to the poor. He's trying to redirect. The key to understanding this guy's idolatry is that instead of seeing the world around him, he saw the world as, as a place in which he was called to protect what it is that he had. And so it wasn't about people. It was about him against the world. And I just need to acquire one more thing, and that's that eternal security, the mystery piece. What happens to me after I die? And if I can get that, then I've got, the, I've got my whole life plan in place. 
And Jesus pulls out the pen and the whole house falls down. And what he calls us to look at when we read this text is that first of all, notice that there is a direct call to total surrender. Total surrender. Why did the man go away sad? Because he was blown away by the cost. Blown away by the cost. Because what was the cost? Everything. I think, secondly, he missed something crucial, and we don't have it here in the Matthew text, but in Mark, it says that Jesus looked at him, and I love this, it says Jesus looked at him and loved him. And the man became more obsessed with the words spoken than the one who spoke them. If he had recognized the look of love, I think he would have given it all away because the peace that he was seeking would never be found in what he was trying to protect because Jesus goes on to say, you want to be first in this world, you're going to be last. You want to be you want to be first in the kingdom of heaven, you've got to be last in this world. That your life is not about you. And the more that we make it about us and about protecting what we have and living falsely and trying to achieve permanent youthfulness and, and be, be attractive to one another and have the acknowledgement and praise of one another and accomplish things that would impress others. If we live with that kind of worldview, it's nothing but an outrageous tyranny that will drive us crazy. And I think that that's the thing that we see more prevalent than anything else in our society is the absolute insane rise of mental instability. And I believe that it is directly connected to a culture that has told us that the only kind of focus that is worthy focus is self-focus. And if we want to actually preach a gospel that changes society, we have to ask ourselves the question, have I truly surrendered everything to Jesus? Are you generous with your... If Jesus said, sell everything you have, and go give it to the poor and pick up your cross and follow me, would you do that? I mean, how do you view even generosity? I think the natural tendency for us in generosity is, is, is that we look at what, what little amount, Lord, what, what amount do you want me to give away? We're so worried about what amount he wants us to give away that we often don't even give anything. We're thinking, do I have to really love Jesus and be marked by generosity? You should be marked by generosity in every facet of your life because you don't understand the gospel if you're not generous. Generous with your time, generous with your energy, generous with your money. Door of Hope is not a church that asks for your money. If anything, we shot ourselves in the foot by almost never talking about it for the first five years. It's not the point. The point is we want Jesus to be our teacher, our co-planner, Give us some clues, some knowledge on how to live successfully in the world today. And if you do that, you know, Jesus, I'll give a little back to you. And Jesus says, no. It's not how I, it's not how I roll. <laughs> Everything or nothing. There's a song by a band I really love out of France, Phoenix, called uh, Everything is Everything off their second record. And I was like, I really love that song. And then I realized that the lyrics are really stupid. Then there's a giant mural, actually, in Portland and Southeast that says everything is everything. Everything is something. It's something. But it will not satisfy. And everything you offer is nothing if we do not abide in Christ. That's the lyrics of my new song I just wrote. Just like I give it to you right now. Because I was so convicted by this message that I would be rather blind with Christ than have a perfect view alone of everything. I want Jesus. That's what I want. But the world tells me that's not what I need, and I believe it sometimes, and so do you. You want to ask yourself that question. Whatever it is that you give ultimate value to whatever it is that you can't imagine living without that is what you worship period that can be people 
That can be jobs, that can be prestige, that can be position, that can be your children. Whatever it is that you cannot live without, that is what you worship. So is that Jesus? It's a good question. Finally, this is the key. The young man leaves sad, but we don't have to. Because our freedom is found in our surrender. And it is the impossible possibility. And this is where I think is so beautiful. Jesus says, how hard is it for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven? It's so hard that it's like a camel trying to enter through the eye of a needle. And, he, and what he is saying is that the more that you have in this world, and we all have a lot, the more that you have, the less you will see your need for me. Because the natural temptation of, of the human condition is to try to achieve satisfaction and life apart from God. That's what we have with the first builder in the Bible, which is Cain. And it's continued right through to the age which we live. The societies that we dwell within, the cities that we admire, is all an emblem of man's attempt to find meeting and satisfaction apart from God. Redemption of a city is found through bringing the king of kings and the lord of lords back to that city. But just know this, that it all is a, is a reflection of our attempt to build Eden once again for ourselves without God. And Jesus says, listen, this is why it's hard for the rich to be saved is because the more they have, the more they will want to protect what they have. The more they have, the less they'll see their need for me. Why do you think there's such incredible amounts of conversions in prison? Because what else do they have? Everything has been taken from them. They don't need anyone to tell them that they're a bad person. That's why they're in prison. They don't need anyone to tell them that their things are going to be taken away from them because it already has been taken away from them. They don't need anyone to tell them that they're not free because they're actually incarcerated. And so the only freedom that is possible to them is the only freedom that actually matters. And that's the freedom from the restless soul of each person. And that's why I love doing prison ministry because it's incredible. <laughs> it's incredibly fruitful. And that's why it's hard to preach the gospel in a city where people have everything. Hard times is the best time for a preacher. And Jesus says this is why it's hard, but then he gives us the great hope. And he says the impossibility for man is possible with God because God's scale always tips toward mercy. Because he's a God of grace. Because he knows that it is his kindness and his goodness and his love and his continual relentless pursuit of broken, rebellious people that reminds us that the gospel is so good. And he comes to set us free. And he finally says at the very end of the whole thing, if I can go through the very last slide. I think there is one more slide, isn't there? Many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. Have you laid down everything for Jesus? I'm not asking if you've given away everything that you have and put your family in some sort of financial danger. I don't want that. What I want is to ask the question is, are you holding everything that this life has to offer with open hands? And are you saying to Jesus, not my will be done, but thy will be done? That's the question. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your word for its power and its ability to transform our lives. And we do pray, Lord, that you would challenge us, convict us, and conform us to your image. And Lord, forgive us for our, our unwillingness to truly surrender to you. Lord, what is it that we would walk away sad